This is from Whispers from Eternity by Paramhansa Yogananda. This is a book of prayer poems and also prayer demands, as Master put it, demanding as a child demands of the parent. <coughs> this is demand that God respond. <coughs> Today, Father, thou hast come into my temple. With thy coming, all the lights of my sense servants have sprung to life, and the door of my heart has been opened wide. Thy blessing has driven away the darkness of ages, sending its heavy vapors fleeing at the first glimpse of thy approach. The loud beating drums of my craving announced thy manifestation. The incense of devotion rising from the incensor of my soul wafts upward to thee. O oh, bless me always, respond to me whenever I call to thee. This reading is from Rays of the One Light by Swami Kriyananda, which are parallel co commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita. This week's reading is entitled, Perfection is Self-Transcendence. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. We begin this week with a passage from the Gospel of St. Matthew in the Bible. Jesus said, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. If you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the tax collectors the same? Always with apologies to any tax collectors. <laughs> if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even pagans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. This teaching is a continuation of last week's lesson. To love all equally is possible only by seeing God everywhere, in others as well as in oneself. See whatever comes to you, unasked for, as a manifestation of his will. Be grateful for the pains you experience, for they are healing strokes of his love. Sometimes healing is affected only by strong measures, but his love for you is manifested in the very attempt to heal. Strive always to be impersonal, as though whatever happens to you were happening to someone else. Persecution gives us the supreme opportunity to deny the thought, this is happening to me, and to affirm our inner freedom from the thought of ego. Don't allow the negative perceptions of others to become your own self-definition. Seek God. This is the true goal of life, though how difficult to cling to in the midst of hatred, spite, and persecution. The Bhagavad Gita tells us in the seventh chapter, Out of thousands, one strives for spiritual attainment, and out of many blessed true seekers, who strive assiduously to reach me, one, perhaps, perceives me as I am. O truth seeker, be one among all those thousands who seeks the supreme goal. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Nice to be here together and nice to have all of you with us online. This um, reading about tests is very uh, necessary. It would be good to reread on a regular basis. When everything's going well, it's easy to sort of go, oh, yeah. So I'm sure for someone having tests, this would be helpful, but <laughs> I am having a good time. But it goes in. And then when the tests come, it's the, start, the memory starts to come back and we start to realize, ah, okay. I remember reading somewhere some words of encouragement, of courage, again, encouragement, that which gives you courage. 
And that's, you know, no coincidence that Swamiji paired the affirmation for courage with the reading for today. He, he put them together. In the original version of that book, he had a certain order of the affirmations, and then he reordered them so that they would match more closely with the reading and um, for that Sunday or for that week. And so I thought it might be helpful to hear some of Master's words, you know, read from a book, uh, on how to face our tests because we, um, they, they give us, you know, constant encouragement and motivation and constant reminder that he's with us and that we're not alone in this. That's one of the greatest uh, or the easiest ways that our tests or Maya tries to defeat us is it says you're alone. No one's here to help. Don't bother calling out. No one will hear you. No one cares. All of that. <clears throat> and if we're speaking of it as I was on a divine level, of course it's not true. God is always listening, helping. You know, I sometimes imagine Divine Mother. Sometimes you see this portrayed in cartoons that, um, you know, there's a little baby walking and or in a movie sometimes a little baby's walking and there are all these dangers around and the adult is trying to push the alligator away and knock away the sort of broken metal sharp thing that was going to hurt the child and slowly drop, I mean quickly dropping a bridge over a big pit so the child can walk across the whole time just like this. That's Divine Mother. You know, and she's doing all of this, with, that's why she has so many arms, because that's how many it takes to protect us. And then at the end of it, when she's got everything, and we finally get there, and we just say, you know, it's really hot out right now. And she just goes, <laughs> you know, I'll see what I can do, you know. So it's just that way, that we have no idea how much we're being protected. And... Um, I mean, the ultimate story, though not one that we practice here regularly, is when Babaji burned the disciple with the log from the fire. So don't worry, there's no plans for, you know, after the satsang. <laughs> but, but he did it. He took it and he just burned, you know, I mean, and again, he didn't say, oh, pardon me for just a moment. He just went, <laughs> and Lahiri Mahashai said, how cruel, because only Lahiri Mahashai would have the nerve to speak up, probably. <laughs> Everyone else would be like, next, next, next. And so, and, and Babaji said, would you rather have seen him burnt to ashes by the power of his past bad karma? And then he touched the disciple and healed him. And that's what the guru does for us. It's not necessarily that he administers pain to us. Sometimes it seems that way. Maybe he is. But it is only to spare us from a much greater pain in the exact same way as a surgeon might make a cut in the body, which under normal circumstances, say, you know, at a party, if a surgeon came up to you, you'd say, excuse me, vain dumb. But in this case, it's because it's trying to spare us of a much greater pain or even loss of life. And so again, this is the method of healing. And so, as it says in the reading, which is a sentence to always remember, that God's love for you is shown by the fact that he's trying to heal, even through a little pain. Because he could just not heal. He could say, you're sick, so what? I'm not sick. You know, sort of like if we, if we hear of some friend of ours who has a relative, who has a neighbor, who has a cousin who is sick, you know, we might say, oh, sorry, and then sort of head off to lunch and not even think about it, because it's just sort of too far out of our world, and our world is complex enough. If they tell you some heartbreaking story, then yes, it stays with us. But otherwise, we sort of om, 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 and maybe we'll add them to the healing prayer list. I mean, we should be compassionate, but it doesn't necessarily stay with us. But, uh, so God is not like that. God, any, anything that's happening to us. He's saying, how can I help? How can I heal you in this moment? Because you are dear to me, just as if something is happening to one of our dear ones that consumes our attention and our energy. And that's right. And so in this way, we should always feel God is trying to help me. Not in the way that sort of, you know, 
God is trying to help me, you know, through all these smacks and tortures that I deserve. And no, it's not that. It's always, as it says, healing strokes of his love. Divine Mother is always trying to heal, to help. You know, it's sort of like, um, you know, when there's a splinter in, the, in a child's hand and it hurts so much. And, it's, and the adult says, listen, I need to take the splinter out. No, no, because it hurts. And then, yes, but if we leave it in there, it's going to get infected and be much worse than it is right now. No, no, it hurts. Just open your hand. No, I won't open it. Open it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. You know, it's already out, huh? I took it out. Oh, nobody out. You just, you see, because there's just that fear of more pain, and the actual thing is just nothing. But once we get into that mode, it's hard. And again, we need healing in the parts that we have a certain element of blindness. So it's not that, okay, this is a test. I see it coming. Here's my hand, Divine Mother. Take out the splinter. That's no test at all. Why? Because kashtamile. It's not hard. So if it's not hard, it's not a test. It's sort of like, okay, are you ready? I'm going to point at you and ask you, what is one plus one? You know, it's fine, but it's like 75,000, six times 55,100. <laughs> Do I have any help from my calculator, you see? So anything that's too easy is not a test. That's why we don't stay in LKG, most of us. Because, it's, uh, anyway, I, I, that's an aside I'll leave for now. But the point is that we have to meet tests that are at our level of strength so that we can increase our level of strength. But remember, they are at our level of strength. They just don't seem it. It always seems that we're thrown into the boxing ring saying, how did I get matched up against this guy? You know, just because it seems so big. But remember, you are big too. And so sometimes that bigness, as I was saying earlier this morning, comes from raising our energy and also expressing that energy outwardly, getting more organized, getting more awake. You know, sometimes we we get into situations where we have to clean up an area of our life that we really don't want to, whether it's literally physically or sort of, you know, on the, like getting our accounts in order or whether it's emotionally, we're giving an emotional audit. But it's to get this part, which has been lying fallow, cleaned up the energy raised, so that more energy can flow in general. And we can fight it, but in some some cases we get away with it. Divine Mother says, okay, fine. But uh, she never really does, because at a certain point there's a knock on the door and it's Sri Yukteswar holding the bill. And it is time to pay. And he's not leaving without that payment. But he's doing that to protect you from prison. (laughs) He's doing that to save you from the authorities. And so he may, he may seem strict, but he's just trying to save you. And he is going to save you because at certain times in your life, no matter how much we avoid it, we keep getting our nose stuck back in it by the world, by the test to say, you, when I say the world, I mean circumstances, saying, you have to clean this up. And the yogi learns to just cooperate and say, whatever comes of itself, let it come. And sometimes you can ask yourself, do I object? to having to do this unpleasant task, yes. But is it wrong? Well, usually it's not wrong. If it is wrong, you should think about it. But if it's just that, no, I just don't want to. But I'm not objecting to it in principle. It's just that I don't want to or I don't want to right now. But if you can get yourself to say yes in any way, then say, suppose I did want to. Or if this is what's coming, let me just get it done now. It wasn't on my schedule. It wasn't on my preference list. But I'll get it done now and then it'll just be over. And so in that way, we just work through it because we can say it's still within Dharma. And if it's Dharma, it's okay then. I don't mind. Anyway, and then say, and then every hour I get to stop and have a Jangri break. Coffee plus Jangri or something. You know, you can always give yourself a little something. So, um, so Master gave many uh, words of encouragement to the disciples about how to make it through our tests. A lot of them are, in fact, probably all of them are internal. 
Even if it's external, if it, it can be internal in terms of how we experience it. Meaning, someone can go through a very difficult test, but feel God with them and say, I just have to do what's needed to make it through and to help the others. Someone else can face the same exact test and be a wreck, be just destroyed because of the inside, the reaction. Either way, you know, is, is a, you know, I'm not casting a judgment on it because the other person who faced it so well might be a wreck about something else. You know, again, if we are brought to our knees, that's a test. The test isn't usually so much about whether we pass the test outwardly, but how we respond to when we are brought to our knees. Do we just give up and say, oh, well, I knew I was alone, or do we say, okay, Divine Mother, <laughs> I tried to do it on my own. I can't. Can you please help? I once prayed to Divine Mother about something. I said, I know that nothing can be done, but it would be nice. Because that's all I could say sincerely. I couldn't say, could you help? Because I felt the situation was hopeless. And so I said that. Nothing can be done, but it would be nice. And the next day, three of the tests just evaporated, you know. In one case, I've told this story before, in one case it was the insurance company that we, where it wasn't really a test, but we had to make a big payment as our final payment to the insurance company for some health thing. And I called the woman to say, because we had been organizing payments, because we'd been late on it, I am sending the last payment now. She said, don't send it. I said, why? She said, because you've overpaid. I said, what? She said, you, we made a billing error and we charged you for something we shouldn't have, so we actually have to give you money back. Now, if you ever doubted the existence of God, it's proven by the fact the insurance company wants to give you money back. You see, I mean, I just, it was, wow, unbelievable. You know, and again, the day after I prayed, you always say, well, if you hadn't prayed, who cares? Just pray. So, um, Master said, I'm sorry, if I had no desires, asked a congregation member, wouldn't I lose all motivation and become a sort of automaton? Many people imagine so, Yogananda replied. They think they'd have no further interest in life, but that isn't what happens at all. Rather, you would find life to be infinitely more interesting. Consider the negative aspect of desire. It keeps you forever fearful. What if this happens, you think, or what if that doesn't happen? You live in a state of anxiety for the future or of regret about the past. Non-attachment, on the other hand, helps you to live perpetually in a state of inner freedom and happiness. When you can be happy in the present, then you have God. Desirelessness doesn't rob you of motivation. Far from it. The more you live in God, the deeper the joy you experience in serving him. And we have a hint of that teaching, because it's such a common one to think that if I had no desires, I'd have no motivation, I'd have nothing to enjoy. But think about when we, for example, have a desire satisfied in that moment. There's, there can be just, ah. And as Swamiji has described it, the desire was like us pinching ourselves. And when we pinch ourselves good and hard, and then let go, ah, it feels so nice. But that's all it is, is an unpinch. Letting go of something we ourselves caused by this pinch. And so sometimes when something happens that Darmini and I had been wanting to happen, you know, some thing that was delayed and the mail finally comes or whatever it is and it comes and we go, ah, unpinch. Because it's still, it was ridiculous. There was no reason to be upset or worried or is it going to come and uh, but still we did. And still then unpinch, call it like it is. That's all. It was going to come anyway. But, um, but when we have that satisfaction of the desire, then what do we desire at that moment? Usually nothing. It's just hmm, content, you know, santosham. You know my story of my cousin, which I haven't told recently. My cousin was dancing <laughs> in Trivandrum, and uh, uh, his grandfather came up to him, and his grandfather was a very scary fellow. His grandfather sort of did Sri Yukteswar impersonations all the time, or imitations, but without the wisdom. And so he came up to his grandson, and he said, Why are you dancing? And the grandson said, 
Santosham. <laughs> and the grandfather smiled. He couldn't help it. He was disarmed and he went on his way. So anyway, Santosham. We're just content. And so we don't have any desires in that moment. But would we say that we're dull, that life is bland, boring? No. It's because of that satisfaction, then I am complete, you know, for five minutes or something until then. Oh, what, what is that? So the thing is to remember that we experience this all the time. When the desire is satisfied, for a short period, perhaps, we feel contentment. And we, and we feel very happy, and we also feel desireless. So that's the proof of the teaching. But the better proof is the one Master gives, which is the more you live for God, the more you fill yourself with meditation, meaning through the process of meditation, you refill your tank, you fill your heart, you have that joy because of just who you are, because I am, because God is, because we are together. You find life is so much more rich and it's more safe because I am happy not because of something outside, which can be taken away. But I'm happy because of something inside, which can't be touched. Even when indulging in a bad habit, this is a new one, Master said, even when indulging in a bad habit because you can't help yourself, let your mind constantly, sorry, let your mind be constantly resistant to it. Never accept that bad habit as a definition of who you really are within. That great example Master uh, had in his life of one of his disciples who was an alcoholic and also wanting to learn spiritual things. And so he would literally have his bottle of whiskey in one hand and his Kriya beads in the other. And his friends just made fun of him. They just said, you're a drunk. How can you try to be all spiritual? And it's just hypocrisy. And the man said, look, I can't help that I have this habit but at least I can do this other good thing. And so he, he just would, you know, do some Kriyas and then take a little hit off the bottle. And then uh, after some time of doing this, he did some Kriyas and then he looked at the bottle and said, I don't, what do I need with this thing? And he just put it aside. And we can say, well, I didn't, you know, when I learned Kriya, we didn't learn it that way. Uh, but <laughs> the thing is that Everything, that bottle of whiskey may not be our particular temptation, but there are plenty of things. And we don't have to regard them as sinful. We regard them as something that I'm still attracted to it even though it hurts me. I'm still attracted to shouting <laughs> even though it hurts me. I'm still attracted to saying nothing and just taking it even though it hurts me. You know, there's always room for growth. But also, I, you know, any bad habits that we have, they're bad because they make us unhappy. That's the best way to look at them. Not they're bad because they're morally sinful. Even then, they're morally sinful because they make us unhappy. Even Master said, that, I mean, Master said even the Ten Commandments, which come from the Bible, which have this aura of sort of, these are the laws, and if you break them, straight to the furnace with you. You know, it's just so dramatic. Commandment. He said they should be titled the Ten Rules of Eternal Happiness. Because he said the rules were given for the benefit to say, look, these are things which may seem appealing, but they aren't. Trust me, they will end in disaster. That's what, I mean, and the niyamas are put the same way. Non-lying. Why? Why non-lying? Well, one thing is because we might be tempted to lie. And Patanjali says, look, better not. And think about it. Why are we tempted to lie, usually? Well, you look at little children, and, you know, most children won't lie, under, with one caveat. They won't lie, because they'll just sort of tell you. I remember I asked one child one thing about something, and he gave me a very honest answer, which was a little too honest. <laughs> but he just said it with such a straight face. I thought, yep, you're absolutely right. And why? There's no reason to be embarrassed about that. If an adult had said it, I would have backed away. But the child was just so open-heartedly, this is the facts. Okay, very good. So, but when do children start to lie? When they are afraid. Did you do it? I didn't do it. Like Davy G tells that wonderful story, her son came into the room and said, Mommy, I didn't do it. <laughs> and she said, where didn't you do it? And he said, <laughs> in the living room. And so then she, 
Yeah, so anyway, so, you know, we, you just have that immediate self. I mean, you feel it and someone asks you something and you worry, maybe it won't happen. And so, ah, I don't want to make them mad, so I might. That's the temptation. It's fear. And so, is it great when we live by fear? No. Is it great when we lie? No. Because why? You can't sleep. That's the problem. Is that too much lying, you can't sleep, either because you feel guilty or you're trying to keep track. Okay, I told him that was the reason. I told her that's the reason. If they talk, I'll say, actually, the re you know, forget it. It's too complex as it is. We try to make up your own reality. Just stick with the truth. But remember, sometimes there are situations where it's not that you have to lie, but you could just remain quiet. Many people are happy for you to be quiet because then they get to talk more. And meanwhile, you don't have to commit yourself in a way that you're not ready to or you don't want to. So there, there's, a, there's a fine line in this, not so much about lying, but in terms of remembering truth is always helpful. Truth is always kind. So there may be different aspects of the truth that are more appropriate to share than others. If you, give, if you come up to someone and they say, why do you like to meditate? And you say, because I want to be one with God they may not be able to relate to that. I mean, I, I shared this, you know, with a, a friend of mine, Vineet. He wanted to come to the center for some classes, but his parents were reluctant to have him make such such a journey. And he, But he wanted to come, and he didn't want to be dishonest, but he said, you know, when they uh, asked me why I want to take these classes, I, I can tell them because I want to merge into God. I said, well... Um, <laughs> maybe we can think of an answer that they could relate to more easily. And so he had taken some uh, accounting classes here, was, that was his profession. I said, is there any one of your professors that you can visit here, or is there any kind of accounting thing you can do while you're here that you can say you're going to do, and then you'd better do it. You can't say, I'm going to do it. <laughs> you have to do it also. And he said, I just got an email from one of my professors inviting me to one of these courses, and he, and he said to me that it is free of cost because of some strange, weird other part of the story. And so I wasn't going to come. I said, please come. And then he came, and he was here, and you know the classes he survived, but he was able to do what he wanted and also not unnecessarily frustrate his parents. He was open, and he said, I'm going to these, you know, I'm going to go to the center also while I'm there, but it's fine because he was doing accounting, and he was. So, you know, you keep that in mind. I, some people say, I don't have time to come to the center. I said, well, why don't you buy some milk in CIT Nugger? We have a store here that sells milk. You can say, I'm going out for milk. Be right back. Or I will be back. And then grab the milk here. Get it. Get the milk. And then you can come. One of the monks here was having a hard time struggling against temptation. I said to him one day, I don't ask that you overcome delusion. All I ask is that you resist it. And this is one of the most comforting things that Master said to any one of us when we feel, here I go in the wrong direction again. And he must be saying, what a failure you are. Or we feel that way. He's saying, I'm asking you to resist. Which doesn't always mean overcome. It just means to say, at the very least, I don't want this. This pattern that I'm in, I don't want it. This action that I'm doing, I don't want it. I'm still doing it, but I don't want it. And that is resisting. <clears throat> and that's what builds the strength that withdraws energy from that pattern and then helps us to one day overcome it. <clears throat> Remember, of course, meditation strikes all of these things at the roots. But we need to know also what to do when we're not meditating. Bad karmic tendencies can be overcome not by concentrating on them, but by developing their opposite good tendencies. Hence the importance of serving God. By service to Him through others, you automatically divert toward the development of good tendencies that energy which wants to take you in wrong, self-serving directions. Be ever busy for God. When you are not meditating, be active for Him. And when meditating, offer your mind up to him in the same spirit of service with keen, alert attention. Keep the mind ever busy with God and with doing good for others. An idle mind is the workshop of the devil.
And one thing that Sri Yukteswar said, it's in here, but I couldn't find it just at this moment. He just said, tests should be meant calmly. I mean, should, yeah, the tests should be met pleasantly and calmly. He had a much better way of saying it exactly, but those words, calmly and pleasantly. He's, oh no, I think he said, karma is best worked out calmly and tests are best meant, best met pleasantly, something like that. To just say, oh, well, a test. Well, it's been a while, I think a whole hour since my last test. Fine. No problem, because again, a lot of the test comes from the, the resistance to it, or the, the vain doming, all the vain doming uh, of it, <laughs> the not wanting it, really hurts. And I, you know, it's funny because Swamiji talked about rising above the body, rising above pain. And he said, sometimes I just put my mind here, and Master literally demonstrated this once when something heavy fell on his foot and crushed his foot, broke his foot, and he winced in pain, and then he said, I'll show you something. And he put his mind here, and instantly his face relaxed, he could walk normally. And then he said, I'll bring my mind back down to the body, and you could see his whole body was tense with pain, and he couldn't move. And then he brought his mind here again, and he was fine. And so... So I, I thought to try this out a few times with a headache, when I had a headache and I might take a, a tablet for it, but I also thought, let me try putting my mind here and see. It wasn't a super bad headache, otherwise I wouldn't have even thought of this. I would have just been laying there. But I put my mind here for a while, tried to put my awareness here like we do in meditation, and what I found was interesting. It wasn't a vast vista of light of Babaji saying, thou art healed. Nothing like that. It was just that I began to relax a little bit. Somehow putting my mind here allowed me to relax. I mean, it was instinctive. I didn't mean to. But I found my body relaxing, and I found in doing that that the pain was just about reduced by half. It wasn't gone, but it was much less. And I realized that a lot of the physical pain came because I was tensing up unconsciously, but I was tensing, of course, because I didn't like the pain. And, and somehow this was just, again, an automatic reaction and just consciously relaxing. There was much less discomfort. And so, of course, we can learn this for specific situations in dealing with chronic pain, consciously relaxing, breathing through the pain, and so on, sure. But still, just putting my mind here, it was enough that that came. And so I can't say that now I do it every single time and never another dolo. But the point is that this, that we can think about that not just with physical pain, but with every kind of pain. To say, put your mind here or open your heart to master, but again, try to consciously relax. Because half of the pain or more, we are causing or we are adding. Or you, to put it another way, we are doubling the pain by the pain itself and then the vein dumb. And so if you just cut out the part that you're adding in, it's a little more bearable. And then it suddenly you can understand how yogis sometimes can do these superhuman things, like Swamiji goes to the dentist without any uh, anesthesia, any Novocaine. He said, I just don't like that numbness in the mouth afterwards, so I just don't like to take it. And uh, as I was saying to some friends yesterday, uh, Swamiji has been singular in his approach to the dentist this way. Uh, nobody has dared to follow. One man tried and said, okay, I, I'll try it too. And then he said to the dentist, you better give me something <laughs> because it was just too much pain. But we can, we, we can start in small ways. Take care of the body. It's not a question of not just forget it. I have this cut. No problem. I'll concentrate here and, you know, watch the blood pour out. No, it'd be good to get, you know, heal the body. But to see what we can do to just relax from that pain. And I'll end with this. This is one very important to remember, maybe even to repeat daily. Objective condi conditions are always neutral. It is how you react to them that makes them appear sad or happy. Work on yourself, on your reactions to outer circumstances. This is the essence of yoga, to neutralize the waves of reaction in the heart. Be ever happy inside. You will never be able to change things outwardly in such a way as to make them ever pleasing to you. Change yourself.